All right, um, I think I'll get started. Um, maybe uh, if there are any stragglers that you all know about, people that wanted to attend, uh, can you ping them in Zulip? I've already quit Zulip and exited for this. Um, so uh, yesterday we talked about how to write a good Docker file. And generally, the image building process um, and how the three technologies in Docker are separate. So today, I want to move on from building images to talking about the container runtime. But before I dive into the runtime, there are a few things I realized yesterday that uh, I just sort of glossed over that were in the Docker file. And I just want to spend um, two minutes to go over those quickly. So one thing you might have noticed um, yesterday in the Docker file at the bottom is our entry point script uh, is actually run with this dumb init program. Uh, so what is dumb init, and, and why do we need it uh, inside of a Docker file? So one of the foundational principles of Docker is that you should only have one process running per container, um, ideally one process. Now, if that process is a web server and it forks uh, you know, four worker processes underneath it, um, that's, that's probably OK to have those in one container. But you wouldn't want to have Node and Webpack running in the same container as Django, for example. And so Docker very uh, strictly sort of discourages people from running init systems inside of their Docker containers. Um, so in general, you should not be running multiple processes. You should just run one process per container. And if you need more than one process, uh, run multiple containers. And we'll, we'll get to orchestrating mul multiple containers later on. So why do I have dumb init here? If we don't need an init system because we're only running, running one process, then what is this for? Well, the answer is because Docker assumes that you're only running one process, it actually doesn't do a very good job of cleaning up containers when you kill a container. And so if your one process in your container uh, forks, you know, let's say, a worker process and like a, a background job and like three other things, um, when you try and kill the container, it'll only kill the parent process. And it won't actually kill all of the child processes. Um, and especially if they have been forked, uh, it won't necessarily clean them up correctly. And so dumb init is just a wrapper script that says, hey, if we get a sig term signal, if this dumb init process gets a sig term, kill all of the child processes and clean up nicely. And this is sort of a, a safety guarantee that no matter what this script does, like no matter what you pass in here, no matter what you run inside of Docker, even if it spawns multiple processes, when you kill the container, it'll all exit safely. The other thing is Gosu. So inside of the entry point, Oops. You might have noticed at the bottom here, I have Gosu. So what is Gosu? Um, Gosu is just a replacement for sudo. So sudo uh, does not exist inside Docker containers by default. Uh, it's not installed. It's a package, actually. It's not a built-in in Linux. Um, and the sudo package is actually part of a much bigger suite of sort of permissions management things. So in general, you don't want to install sudo in Docker. Um, Gosu is an alternative written in Go. It's super simple. All it does is drop down to a given user. Um, and it's built specifically for Docker. So it handles some of the edge cases around permissioning uh, slightly better than trying to do this with sudo. Um, exec means when you run the gosu command, kill the bash process and just run gosu. So essentially, change the PID of the bash process to be the PID of the gosu process and kill the bash process. Why would we use exec? Well, because you don't remember, we only want one process per container. So when this bash script runs, this process is bash. And if bash runs anything inside of bash, all of those processes are child processes of bash. And so in order to avoid that case where you have uh, you know, bash, and then inside of bash, you have run server. And then inside of run server, you have your like uh, worker one, worker two, worker three processes. You run exec, and then it drops the bash process, and it promotes run server to be the top level process. So exec in general is a good habit. Whenever you're running one final command at the end of a bash script, you want to hand over the PID to that command and exit out of bash. Um, the last thing I, I'm not going to go in, into any real detail on, um, but there are other strategies that I didn't go over yesterday on shrinking your image sizes. Um, and it's not just premature optimization. Uh, shrinking your image actually matters to developers, because when your image is really big, it's very difficult for people to develop. It takes multiple minutes for it to rebuild. So keeping image sizes small is quite important. Um, and there are a number of tools besides the multi-stage builds that we talked about yesterday. Uh, there's also a tool called Docker Slim that can do it automatically. 
you give it your image and it just figures out how to make it smaller. Um, I'll let you discover that on your own though. Uh, I won't spend any time uh, going into the details of that. All right, so moving on. Today, what I really want to talk about is the container runtime. So Docker images built with Docker files actually meet a, a specification that's larger than Docker. And it's called the OCI, the Open Container um, Initiative, I think it is, Open Container something. Um, and it it's basically describes a standard format for images and containers um, to be shared between different container runtimes. So Docker is actually only one of several different container runtimes. There's also LXC on Linux. Um, LXC and LXD are the sort of VM and container management tools that Ubuntu provides. There's also uh, Podman. So Podman is an alternative to Docker that runs uh, in user mode as non-root, which is a big deal because one of Docker's biggest pitfalls is that it runs as root. And so I mentioned yesterday that if, if you run something as root inside of your Docker file, you know, like if user here is root, then potentially there are exploits that allow root running code inside of your container to escape the container and mess with your host system. So you really don't want to run stuff as root inside of Docker. But Podman and some of these alternative runtimes actually fix that problem by running Docker as, as non-root. Um, you can do more research on those on your own. Um, but just know that, that the container runtime is a generic technology to run containers. And it's not just Docker. Um, Docker provides one by default called container D, but you can use any container runtime. So how is storage handled in Docker? Um, I mentioned yesterday, when you're building a Docker file, each one of these commands is a layer. And a layer is essentially a snapshot of the file system stored as, as a diff from the previous snapshot. And so if this layer adds the readme and the package.json, then this layer is really a, a file system snapshot containing only those two files. So the way that Docker does this is using a file system called btrfs. Um, if you've heard of ZFS, it's similar to that. Uh, it's essentially a snapshotting file system um, and uh, it makes it easy for Docker to do this sort of layer diffing system. Um, in production, though, we can actually use other uh, storage engines, um, not necessarily overlayFS or BTRFS. So you could use um, ZFS. Uh, what are the advantages of that? Well, ZFS has really nice snapshot features. So if you're running a Postgres container, let's say, instead of uh, you know rsync dot slash data Postgres to some remote server, um, this might actually produce a corrupt backup because if Postgres is running, you know, if Postgres is active and you attempt to backup just the data deer without snapshotting it, um, you're going to get partially committed state in that in that directory, and the sync takes you know maybe 30 minutes, and during that time you're getting writes the whole time, and so you're going to leave this directory in an inconsistent state. So one of the advantages of a of a storage driver like ZFS is you can do this: you can do ZFS snapshot, um, you know, my pool. You have to call your pool something. Um, and then you put a date, you know, and it instantly snapshots uh, the entire file system. And then you can ZFS send to some other server, ZFS receive, so on and so forth, operate on that snapshot. Um, in general, you don't want to change the storage driver from the default, um, but be aware that uh, there are other options. And it, it's worth learning about how the storage driver system works in general. So now that we understand that there is a storage driver that provides sort of the interface with a storage layer, um, how do we interact with it um, at runtime? Sort of what are the ways that as a, as a developer, you're going to be interacting with it? And usually that's in the form of volumes. So let's check out a Docker Compose file now. Um, in general, all of the options in a Docker Compose file are equivalent to their sort of Docker run um, command line arguments. So if you see, uh, you know, TTY here, there's an equivalent flag to docker run um, dash IT. And if you see environment here, there's an equivalent flag, docker run dash E. Uh, if you see volumes, there's an equivalent flag, docker run dash V, so on and so forth. I'm going to use the Docker Compose file to explain these concepts going forward. Um, but you can translate in your head, you know, anytime you see an option here, if you're just running raw Docker commands, um, there always exists an equivalent option for raw Docker commands. But we're going to use the compose file going forward because uh, it's a nice declarative way to, to show what a Docker container requires. So volumes. What are volumes? I mentioned volumes are not available at build time. So volumes are a bit of storage that's exposed to a container at runtime. And it's mounted 
when the container starts, and it's unmounted when the container ends. That mounting and unmounting is sort of a virtual process. Um, the storage driver that you chose, let's say overlayFS, is going to be translating system calls from inside the container saying, I want to access this file, I want to access this file, I want to access this file. It's going to be translating the, uh, the files that actually get read to equivalents on the host system. So there's a process sitting in between you and the host system uh, anytime you're, you're accessing data through volumes. Um, on Mac OS, it behaves slightly differently than on Linux. On Mac OS, it's bound to a VM. Um, and so the permissions are sort of automatically handled for you. Um, but on Linux, um, any directory mounted from the host system into the container um, is going to share the same uh, permission uh, permissions and owner and group um, as the files on the host system. So we talked a bit about that yesterday. I won't go it all, over it all, all again, but um, just remember that volumes uh, mount directories from your host system and the permissions are shared. So any change inside the volume will also affect the host files. So why do we want to mount a directory? You know, Docker also gives us the option of using something called named volumes. So we could say, um, you know, archive box data here and mount that to the data directory. And then up here, we could define a volume section and put archive box data here. When you do this, Docker sort of keeps track of this volume for you. It creates what's called a named volume, and it lives somewhere in your file system. And the only way to interact with it is through Docker. Um, you can either mount it to the host, or you can spin up a container to access the contents. But it's sort of a magic black box. Um, and it's really hard to introspect the contents of uh, Docker named volumes easily. In general, my opinion is that you should not use Docker named volumes. I think they are a foot gun. Um, I think they lead to more pain than good because you can't easily mount this on the host system. And so it's very easy to lose track of the fact that you have these data directories, right? It's very different from just having like ver lib uh, Postgres data, and then all your data is inside that folder. And then anytime you want to back up or, you know, or sync your data somewhere else, all you have to do is copy that folder. This named volume is a mystery you know, binary blob that lives somewhere on your file system. And it's up to Docker to take care of it for you. And it's really hard to introspect that sort of binary blob and, and manage it and like back it up to other places and keep track of it. Because sometimes you might want to clear your Docker cache. Let's say you do Docker system prune uh, on your host machine. If you're not careful, if your container stopped uh, and you pass all to this, it's going to delete all of your named volumes. And there goes all your production data. So in general, I don't think you should use named volumes. You should always mount a real directory on the host system um, when you want to share data inside of a container. So what does that look like? In practice, it's a good idea to mount a directory relative to the location of the Docker Compose file. And that way, all of your state when you run a project is all nicely contained in one folder. You have your Docker Compose file, you have a folder called data, and then inside the folder called data is a folder named for each container. So here we have an archive box image, and we can mount data slash uh, you know archive box to data in here. Um, you know, let's say we have uh, let's pretend we have a database image like Postgres. You know, image Postgres Alpine and volumes in here. We could mount dot slash data Postgres to ver lib Postgres data. And now all you have to do is look inside the data folder, and you'll find all of your Postgres data. And anytime you want to, uh, let's say you want to move your project from your local dev machine, dev machine to a server, all you have to do is rsync the entire folder. Inside is the Docker Compose file, the data folder, and everything inside the data folder needed to start the app. And you don't have to worry about there being separate state that might be living elsewhere on the system. So when you have a Docker named volume, if you just tried to rsync the app, you'd be missing all your data because it's still stuck in a named volume somewhere on the host. So try and keep all of your state inside folders easily mountable as volumes. Now, there are a couple flags that you can add when you define a volume. If you add RO at the end, uh, that stands for read only. So it means that the files mounted from the host into the container will not be writable by the stuff inside the container. This is great for config files, um, secret files, anything that you generally don't expect the container to be modifying. So let's say you have uh, you know, like etsy certs uh, some cert.pem, and you want to mount this into the container. Unless you expect Postgres to be modifying this cert, you should absolutely add RO at the end. 
Um, and that's just an extra layer of safety. Uh, and you can rest safely knowing that the container not only doesn't have permission to modify those things, uh, but within the container doesn't have permission, but also Docker is enforcing that it doesn't have permission. Uh, RW, you can add that if you want. Uh, it doesn't do anything because RW is the default read write. And then Z, uh, Z is, a, is an interesting one. So if you're going to share the same data folder between two different Docker containers, like let's say for some reason you wanted ArchiveBox to directly access the Postgres data folder. If you mount it like this, you're going to run into problems with uh, file system level locks not being propagated properly between the two because Docker sort of assumes that only one container at a time is going to be accessing a data folder. So if you want to actually share a, a volume between two different Docker containers, just add Z at the end. Uh, but don't add that unless you need it, right? Don't go adding Z to every single volume in a Docker file unless you actually expect it to be shared between two containers, um, because it's slightly less performant and uh, it's confusing to the reader to see stuff being shared if it's not actually shared. OK, let's talk a little bit about backups. So we have this data folder. Um, you know, All of our services in our Docker file are storing all of their state inside of this data folder, inside of folders within that named after the container. Um, how do we back it up? So generally, remember what I talked about um, with snapshots. right? If it's something like a database that's running continuously, you cannot just sync this folder to another server uh, and, and hope that it will be OK. Right? During the copy process, you're going to be collecting writes in the database. And so as you copy it, you're going to copy half written writes, um, and it's going to result in an inconsistent format. So what's a good way to do uh, Docker backups? Um, one way is to have a separate container called backups with a command inside uh, that's something like bin bash dash c while true run backups sleep you know, 6,000 or whatever. And this will just, in a loop, uh, you know, every however many seconds, you know, 10 hours or whatever you set it to, uh, it will run a backup script that can snapshot this uh, data folder and rsync it to another server. That's one approach. Another approach is inside of your Postgres container, um, there's actually uh, an option to mount scripts. So you could mount bin backup into uh, bin maintenance, I think it is. Uh, and then in your Postgres, uh, your Postgres image wouldn't, uh, sorry, your Postgres container wouldn't run these by default. But you could have an external script, let's say in a cron job or in supervisor D, run something like this, docker compose exec Postgres bin maintenance. So that's a decision you're going to have to make. Do you want your backups to be sort of scheduled within a Docker container? Or do you want your backups to be scheduled outside of Docker on an init system on the host, like supervisor D, system D, you know, one of those, and then run Docker commands to, to do your backups? Um, in general, I recommend keeping everything inside of, uh, inside of the Docker Compose file. But don't overcomplicate it. Uh, you know, don't, don't put like a 50-line backup script in your Docker Compose file. Um, there are elegant ways to do it. And if you're using ZFS, the most elegant way is just ZFS snapshot dash R. Cool. Yeah. You know, um, if you snapshot the volume that contains all of your Docker state, this completes instantly. So it doesn't have the problem of copying half written state. Um, another approach is also just to use your, your cloud provider's backup option. Um, but keep in mind, uh, it's often not very frequent. And uh, you're putting all your eggs in one basket. So it's always good to have a redundant, uh, redundant backup system uh, in your Docker setup. Um, so yesterday, we talked about passing UID and GID into the container. And just a quick refresher. So what that does is we create a non-root, non-privileged user inside of Docker to run all of our Docker commands as, to run all of our application commands as. Um, but when that non-root user doesn't match the non-root user on the host OS, uh, it causes uh, permissions mismatch problems, where the user ID is different on the files inside and outside. So we gave the option of passing P, uh, PUID and PGID um, in order to update that user to have the same UID and GID as the host user. So what does that look like at runtime? So what we'd actually do is, in here, 
under environment, we'd put PUID equals a thousand and PGID equals a thousand. Um, you know, or whatever this uh, user ID on your host is. You know, on Mac it might be 501 or something. Uh, remember, all of these things also translate into Docker run commands. So I'm not going to go over per permissions all over again, um, but it is something that you're going to have to configure at runtime if you want it to be absolutely perfect uh, and you're running on Linux. So let's talk about networking. Um, how does networking between Docker containers work at runtime? So by default, Docker could create something called the default network. And you can define your own networks at the top of the file. So for example, you could do you know, ABC, whatever, my net, um, and set it to external and set the name to ABC, whatever, my net. So what does this mean? So this means that if you wanted to share a network between multiple Docker Compose projects on a single computer, you could create this network using a command like this, docker network create abc whatever my net. Now, this network um, is available globally to all Docker containers on your machine, um, but you have to tell them to connect to that network. So by creating this network, I, I can now use it inside of my Docker Compose file. And you do that by defining it as external, and then you pass the name of the external network that you want to use. And now, inside of here, if I want this container to connect to this network, instead of the default network that it's on, I would use something like this, networks. And I still want it to connect to the default network. right? The default network is what connects all of the containers within a project by default. So if we don't add default here, Archivebox won't be able to talk to Postgres. So we keep default, and then we also add ABC, you know, whatever, my net. And with this way, you can define your own subnets and connect containers however you want. Uh, in general, I recommend just use the default network. Uh, unless you have a reason to do you know, advanced Docker networking stuff, uh, try to avoid it. Uh, it's, it's confusing for most people and often unnecessary. So how do we expose traffic inside of our container to the real world then? There's this ports option, and there's also an option called expose. So what's the difference between these? So expose is actually a no-op. Uh, expose doesn't do anything. All of the containers within a network, by default, can talk to each other on all ports. So saying, I expose 8,000 on this container to this container actually isn't doing anything. right? This container already has permission to talk to this container on 8,000, and they're already both on the same network, the default network. So what is expose here? Expose is just telling the user, the person reading the Docker file, hey, FYI, this container is uh, providing some traffic on this port. It used to be required in old Docker versions. Um, but it's still a good idea to use it uh, in order to explicitly show the reader of your Docker Compose file um, exactly what port a container is exposing stuff on. So maybe you know this server command exposes on 8,000, but maybe there's actually uh, you know a debug port that's also exposed on 8080. There would be no way to know that just by looking at this unless you add it to expose. So it's always a good practice to keep all of the ports that might be exposed by a container and are used by other containers defined here in expose. Things that are exposed are not exposed to the host system. That's important to understand. You're just saying this container exposes 8,000 to all of the other containers on the same network. Now, if you want to expose 8,000 on the host system, then you have to use ports. So ports binds a host port to a container port, meaning traffic arriving at 8,000 on the host will get piped to 8,000 inside the container. And you can define it. Uh, it's TCP by default, but you could also do, you know, uh, if DNS is a good example, you could also do UDP. Um, and you can put TCP here if you want to explicitly say it, but most people don't put TCP because it's TCP by default. In general, you don't want to expose ports unless you absolutely have to. So Postgres is a great example, right? Postgres exposes, um, I believe it's 5432 to all of the other containers to connect to Postgres. Do you actually need to access Postgres from your host machine? Or are you going to be doing all of your development through Django or through your application? If you don't need to access Postgres from the host machine, then don't add ports here. You should only use Expose. If you're doing local development and you need to access it for you know, two minutes quickly to check something, don't commit it to Git. You, know, you can just locally put ports here and then expose it for a few minutes and then change it back to Expose. Um, but in general, don't commit um, 
public ports into the Docker Compose file because someone might run it on production, and you don't want to expose 5432 on production um, to the world, right? You only want it to be accessible to your other containers. So it's a good practice to keep your Docker file ready for production and safe to run in production. Um, if someone were to run your Docker file without thinking about it, uh, it should never create a dangerous situation. Um, any questions so far about expose or ports or networking? Um, uh, yeah, I have a question. So if all the ports are shared, um, then would it in theory be possible for one container to expose to the host traffic from another container's port? So like if, if you put uh, 5432 up where your cursor is, where no, where your cursor was, if you no in ports, so even though this, uh, even though this container isn't doing anything on 5432 since it's shared, it would expose that traffic. It seems like it's kind of odd to me that these ports are exposed on the container level when it's really a network level setting. Oh, Is that so right? I, I think there's an important, um, important thing to understand here, which is that the containers operate as completely separate machines on the Docker network. So when you expose 5432 on this container, you're not at all exposing 5432 on this container, right? These are essentially VMs on a network. Um, and okay. so exposing ports on one does not affect the ports exposed on the other at all. Okay. Does that make sense? This is like a subnet with, with virtual computers inside of it. And each container is its own okay. computer. And so if you, if, you know, if you expose this container's 5432 to the host, you only get access to this container's 5432, not this one's. OK, I got you. Thanks. Uh, now, if you had like a bounce server in here, you know, like command uh, relay traffic from 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, 5432 to Postgres, you know, 5432, then you know you could do that because these containers can access each other, and this one would be exposed to the host. But unless you're doing something like that, um, the ports are really container specific. Okay, got it. Thanks. Cool. So if the ideal Docker file is no ports exposed, um, you know, that's the most secure scenario. Um, but then how do people access your app, right? Like, let's, let's say we do expose here 8,000, and we, do, we don't bind it to the host. Um, now it's only accessible within Docker. Uh, how do people actually visit your app? Um, good question. So there's this thing called sidecar containers. Sidecar containers are a really nice way to handle ingress, uh, meaning traffic coming in to your app. So let's quickly go over what are some of the options for ingress. So in this Docker Compose file, we have a demo app. Um, it's just running Nginx. And it's, it's exposing a service on port 80. Uh, and that's it. You know, This app is running away and is running. And we want to allow people to access the traffic uh, on 80. But we don't want to expose port 80 directly to the internet, uh, because maybe evil people are trying to DDoS us or something. So what are some ways that we can allow traffic from the internet to access this container? Um, Tailscale is one of them. Uh, this is a, a WireGuard-based VPN that allows uh, traffic to hit uh, public Tailscale servers and then get routed to your machine. Uh, we don't need to look at that right now. WireGuard is another way to do it. It's a VPN. So for example, on a remote server, let's say you have a really beefy public server facing the world. Uh, you could open a tunnel, a WireGuard tunnel, from your local container to that public server, and then tell the public server, hey, send me any traffic that you get on port 80. Um, and this would be a way to like load balance stuff between multiple machines, or have a firewall in front of your machine, or something like that. At Monatical, we use something called Argo. Um, I'll come back to Argo in a second. Um, but the other two most common ones are uh, you know, Let's Encrypt uh, or, or an equivalent like Caddy. So you could have a container that provides uh, SSL standing in front of ArchiveBox. Um, and this container would expose port 443, and it would pass everything once it's been um, you know, wrapped in a cert. Uh, it would pass everything to your other demo uh, Nginx container. Uh, Caddy is very similar. It's like Nginx. It's, it's another web server that would stand in front of your app and protect it. Um, and you could also do this with SSH reverse tunnels. Uh, there are lots of different ways to allow traffic to enter your app. But all of these containers, um, you know, why are they called sidecar containers? Well, let me show you how they would be used in practice. 
So we're defining a container here called Argo. Um, now Argo has a special thing here called network mode. Now network mode means instead of creating this container as a separate sort of VM or computer exposed to the Docker default network, we're going to bind this container's entire networking stack to another container. So you put the name of the service that you want to bind to. So in this case, it would be ArchiveBox. And then you say it depends on ArchiveBox, meaning ArchiveBox has to start first, and then this will start. And then this opens a tunnel to Cloudflare and says to Cloudflare, any traffic that you get on this domain, archivebox.service.io, send it to ArchiveBox on port 80. Um, so this would work without network mode. Right? You could have another container in your Docker network. It would open this tunnel to Cloudflare. Cloudflare would send all of the traffic to us. And then this container would route it to ArchiveBox. Right? So that's a network hop. It goes from this container to this container. Within a container network, all of the containers are accessible by their, by their name. So notice here I do ArchiveBox colon 80. That's equivalent to connecting to this container. Um, Docker handles mapping the uh, DNS and host names and all that within container networks. So this tunnel needs to start after the application. It opens a tunnel to Cloudflare. Cloudflare sends us the traffic, uh, and everything works great. The problem is that um, intercontainer networking uh, is a little bit slow uh, because it's all virtualized, right? Just like we have OverlayFS, which is a file system driver that handles translating all the file system calls, um, the networking is also done in software. Um, so all of the network system calls are also being translated. So this introduces. Um, a little bit of an unnecessary hop to go from this container to this container. Um, and it's a little bit more efficient to just run them uh, on the same container. And then you can put localhost here. So that's what this network mode does, is it says, make this container, share the networking stack with this container. And then when traffic comes in and it gets routed, it just gets routed uh, to its own app. You're not introducing an extra network hop between the, the containers uh, in the network. Now, in theory, you could do this with everything, right? You could do. Uh, you know, network mode service archive box here, and then uh, everything would appear to be just running on localhost. And then this would connect to, you know, uh, Postgres host equals localhost uh, 5432. Um, that's a little bit overkill. Um, I, I don't think you should do that. Um, but in the case of ingress containers, uh, I think it makes sense. Uh, and it's uh, in practice a little bit faster to share the network stack like that. Um, Ordinarily, I wouldn't go over this sort of sidecar container setup in an intro to Docker talk. Um, but the reason why I do is because all of the Monadical projects in production use Argo. So it's important to understand how this Argo um, you know, sidecar networking ingress setup works uh, if you're going to be working on Monadical projects. The benefits are Ar of Argo are many. Um, I'll do a whole talk section on Argo um, to, to go into the details of why we actually use Argo instead of just using Nginx or something. Um, but I'll save that for, for later on. OK, do people get that so far? Um, uh, oh, another thing you can do with network mode is network mode host. So if you do network mode host, uh, it uses your entire host machine's networking stack. So then you don't need ports. Um, so let's say this, this container, uh, uh, let me demonstrate it with the archive box container so it's slightly clear. Um, this container exposes something on port 8000, right? So if we do ports. 8,000, 8,000. It maps 8,000 on the host, 8,000 on the container. OK, we got that so far. What happens if we do network mode host? This ports now becomes a no-op, because the networking stack of the container is already the networking stack of the host. So by running something on 8,000 that's exposed inside the container, it's already exposed on the host. So this does nothing. So network mode host is quite dangerous. You generally don't want to use it. Um, but occasionally, uh, you really, really need it. Um, like Let's say you're running some complicated network software uh, that access it, that provides tons of different ports to tons of different things on your network, and you mostly trust the container, like it's not a security concern. Then you could use network mode host uh, to share your whole networking stack. Um, cool. So quick summary: expose uh, is between containers, ports is public to the host. Network mode lets you override the behavior of the networking stack in general and create something called sidecar containers. Um, and all of the containers are on a default network. Uh, 
uh, but you can expose them and uh, you know give them manual IPs or create subnets or do all sorts of uh, more advanced networking things if you want by defining networks at the top of the file. Um, inside of containers, the way DNS works. So how does the Postgres container, you know, how does Archivebox talk to the Postgres container, right? Well, we could we could tell it um, Postgres host equals Postgres, but they're on a network together, and that network is created by you know the default network, and the subnet is going to be something like 172.10.99. You know, whatever. Docker makes really weird subnets for the containers. Um, and then each container on the subnet gets its own IP address. So like, uh, so the first one would be, you know, let's say archive box is dot two, and then Postgres is dot three. So when we tell archive box connect to Postgres, right? How does it translate that into an actual IP address of the container on the network? Um, well, the way Docker does it is kind of cheating. Um, it literally just writes into Etsy hosts um, archive box equals this IP. Oops. And uh, Postgres equals this IP. So it's not really doing any fancy DNS things. It's just hard coding in every container when it starts. Uh, it sort of monkey patches the container and adds the, the host names and IP addresses of all the other containers. If you give it something that's not defined in Etsy hosts, like let's say we say Postgres host is like postgres.example.com. Right, that's a real DNS request. It has to go out to the internet to see what the IP address that is. Um, it uses the same DNS servers as your host system by default. However, you can also do this. You can also define your own DNS servers. So this ends up being really useful if you're doing some sort of like service discovery or if you're manipulating DNS somehow, or if you want to uh, expose a very special DNS server to, to certain containers but not other containers. Um, you can override what DNS servers are used as the fallback here. Um, this behaves differently on Mac OS and Linux, uh, so beware, uh, it can be a foot gun. Cool. So we talked about intercontainer networking. We talked about ingress. Um, let's talk a little bit about security. So I mentioned that network mode host, uh, host is a bit dangerous. Um, why is that? Well, it, it shares the network stack of the host system. And generally, you don't want to expose resources on the host to your containers uh, willy-nilly, right? Like the, the whole point of Docker is that you're isolating stuff in your containers from stuff on your host. So this is one thing you can do to sort of remove some of those isolation layers. Um, what are some other things we can do? So remember, every container is running the same kernel as the host OS. That's how Docker works. The kernel is shared between containers and the host. And only the application or the, or the user mode stuff changes from container to container. So when the kernel is shared, that means also that kernel modules are shared. So what's a kernel module? Um, your graphics driver is a kernel module. Um, if you're using VPN software like WireGuard, that's a kernel module. Um, your, uh, like maybe you have a fast, uh, MP4 decoder on your laptop. Uh, many, many computers come with uh, hardware encoders and decoders for video these days. Uh, accessing that is via kernel module. And kernel modules are shared between all the containers. So if you want to give a container access to kernel modules to add, remove, or like read the contents to figure out what kernel modules are available, you have to add something. Um, and you have to figure out what capabilities you have to add depending on what it needs. So a VPN container is a great example. So VPNs like Tailscale need access to net admin. Yeah, so here's WireGuard. WireGuard needs access to net admin in order to create a network interface for WireGuard. And WireGuard is a VPN software that runs in the kernel. And in order to access that kernel module, it also needs sysmodule. So in order to use anything kernel related, uh, let's say file systems, uh, VPNs, um, you know, graphics drivers, CUDA, anything that really like messes with your hardware or, or involves uh, touching the kernel, um, you're going to have to add some, some capabilities here uh, using cap add. You can also do 
privileged equals true, which gives all of the capabilities. And essentially, you're running what's in the container directly on the host. So this is Docker without Docker. Right? If you want to use Docker Compose as a format to orchestrate processes on your host machine without actually running anything in Docker, really, uh, you know, you have none of the isolation protections, none of the security guarantees, uh, none of that stuff. You can use privilege equals true. Um, in general, don't. It's a bad idea. Uh, you almost never need it. Right? You, you almost always can do with uh, individual capabilities or permissions, depending on what the, what the project is. Uh, SysCTLs are another thing. So SysCTL, I, I don't know if you've ever looked in the file, um, etsy sysctl.conf. Um, but these are all of this sort of flags that configure the runtime behavior of your kernel when you boot. Um, and so some of these things can be overridden on a container by container basis. So you know different behavior about the networking stack or uh, you know the maximum amount of memory used for the page cache or stuff like that, right? really low level system tuning. Uh, you can do that via this CTLs um, option. Um, do not try and modify it inside the container like this. This is a bad idea. Always use the Docker provided one um, because it does it properly. So we have these security restrictions um, to make sure that containers are only doing what we allow them to do. Um, what are some other things? What are some other ways that we can restrict containers? Well, we can restrict their resources. So you notice here how I have CPUs, memlimit, and restart defined here. These are options that were made available in Docker Compose version 2.4 and then removed in Docker version 3 and then brought back in Docker version 3.9. So I, apologies for the confusion. Um, Docker messed up by removing them in 3, uh, and they acknowledged that and brought them back in 3.9. But it's just something to remember. Um, in order to use these features, you either have to use version 2.4 or 3.9. In general, just avoid 3.anything unless it's 3.9. 2.4 is sort of a, a different version than 3. It's, it's, um, if you want to learn some of the history, so Docker uh, initially created Docker uh, for containerization. Um, but really, as a company, the way they make money um, is through container orchestration. So they initially were competing with Kubernetes um, by providing their own thing called Swarm. And Swarm was built on top of Docker Compose, and it let you run containers on multiple machines. So you would essentially connect machines into a Docker Swarm. You'd give a Docker Compose file, and it would figure out how to deploy your containers on all the machines, such that if any one machine went down, it would like rearrange them. Um, Swarm has basically failed at this point. Docker has, a, has stopped working on it. Um, it's no longer really a thing. And so when they removed these features in version 2.4, they were trying to push people towards Swarm to use the equivalent features in Swarm. But now that Swarm has failed, uh, they brought these features back to Docker Compose uh, in version 3.9. So that's a little bit of history. Um, so what do these do? So CPU says, give this container access permission to use 100% of two of my CPUs on my machine. And memory limit is just a, a general memory limit on the container. Don't set these unless you have to. Setting these actually massively slows down the container because you add another layer in between the container and the host system where for every system call, it checks, hey, are you using all of your quota of CPU power? If so, you're allowed to do this. Otherwise, you have to wait. You have to block until uh, you have your turn again to do this thing. And so introducing CPU limits and memory limits on all of your containers will actually dramatically slow down your app. Um, you only want to introduce it when you're suspicious that a container is using more resources that it needs, and you want to sort of throttle that container. So WireGutter is, is a great example. right? This is a VPN. Uh, all this is doing is routing traffic from some other node to this node. Sometimes I see WireGuard using three CPUs 100%. And I'm not even routing traffic. So I'm like, I don't want WireGuard doing that. I'm going to put a limit here. And I put CPUs limit two and memory limit here. Um, but don't go putting limits uh, everywhere unless you actually need them, because it'll slow down your app. Uh, restart on failure, what does that mean? So normally, if, uh, if a container fails when it starts up, or let's say it exits uh, you know, while it's running, and Docker didn't expect that, uh, the container is just going to go down. And Docker is not going to make any attempt to restart it. So we often want to tell Docker Compose, hey, if one of these three containers fails, uh, restart it. Uh, you know, often restarting it is, is enough to get it running again. Um, like compilation errors, or like API errors, or too much load. Like all of these cases are helped by just restarting it. Um, I like to put restart failure on all my containers. Um, the other option is uh, restart always. So restart always means when you boot the machine, start this container. 
I recommend not using restart always. Um, and the reason is because we don't actually use Docker Compose to start things on boot. We use Supervisor D around Docker Compose at Monadical. Um, if you don't want to use Supervisor D, if you just want to use pure Docker, you can use restart always, and then you, all of your containers will start on boot time. And then if they ever fail at any point, Docker will attempt to restart them. The other reason why this isn't so great is because if you're a developer on the server and you're trying to run Docker commands, uh, let's say you stop a Docker container to try and like inspect it. Uh, if you forget about this thing, Docker is just going to immediately restart the container again. So I generally don't like using restart always because it leads to a lot of counterintuitive situations as a sysadmin trying to interact with the system where stuff goes down and I want it to stay down because I'm doing some maintenance or something and it pops back up again. And the only way to change that is by editing this file. So it's better, in my opinion, to use on failure and then use an init system around Docker Compose, uh, let, like let's say Supervisor D. Um, so that would be like program run Docker. This would be program equals Docker Compose up and stop as group equals true. So this is like a, a tiny Supervisor D uh, definition that starts your entire Docker Compose project. And then if the whole project fails, if all of the containers stop, this command will exit, and then supervisor D will restart it. So it's sort of having two layers of init systems. Um, when you design your Docker Compose files, you're going to have to decide how do you want your things to be started at boot? Do you want Docker to start it at boot, or are you going to use a different init system? Or do you want it to be started at boot at all? Maybe it's OK to just SSH into the server and run the app in Tmux. And then the developers can see all the error output there, and maybe you don't even need an init system. So think carefully about what behavior you want um, for containers starting and stopping automatically, and whether or not you want Docker to do that job. Cool. Let's let's talk about some of the sort of gotchas with using Docker uh, input and output passing. So Docker Compose is very nice because it sort of fixes a lot of the foot guns around standard in and standard out passing. So what do I mean by foot guns with standard in, standard out? So when you run a command in Docker, let's say Docker run um, Ubuntu bin bash. By default, this runs in non-interactive mode, meaning bin bash will not see a standard in uh, and a standard. <clears throat> it will not see a standard in that the user can type into. So this command will think that it's not inside of an interactive terminal. It will think that it's being run as a script. So if I press Enter here, uh, oops, it's going to, sorry, it has to pull the image. Um, it's going to run bin bash and then immediately exit. So in order to tell Docker, hey, I want to actually pass my standard in and my standard out to this command that I'm running. Yeah, so see, when I run here, we haven't attached any standard in or standard out. So bash runs and immediately exits. So in order to tell Docker, hey, give it an interactive terminal, pass my standard in and standard out to this container, you pass, uh, pass dash IT. And that stands for dash uh, interactive and uh, TTY. And now when we run it, it should drop us into a bash prompt where we can do echo hi, uh, you know, read input. And now it asks us for input and it stores it in input. Um, so everything works. Standard in, standard out works, works as expected. But unless you pass that IT flag, uh, standard in, standard out uh, will not work as you expect. Now, this is different from Docker Compose. Docker Compose actually runs everything with IT mode by default. So if you Docker Compose run um, you know, some container bin bash, it will drop you into the terminal by default. And you can type in, you can type out uh, standard in, standard out work by default. If you don't want that behavior, if you want to uh, prevent it from requesting standard in or standard out, then you use dash capital T. So just remember, the default behavior for passing standard in, standard out is to not pass it for Docker and require a flag to enable it. And the default behavior for Docker Compose is the opposite. It passes it and requires the flag to disable it. Um, you can also hard code in the Docker file standard in colon true standard in open colon true, and tty colon true. Uh, I believe these are the defaults, though. So you don't need to put these here. If you wanted to prevent it, you could put false here. I like putting it here because it indicates to the user reading this Docker Compose file that, hey, this process is going to be interactive. Um, you know, Someone on the terminal can 
Docker compose run, run archive box, you know, add some URL like this. Um, and then they could like type in, um, in response and stuff like that. It also allows you to do, to pipe things into Docker compose. So you could do this. But without that standard in open, without that TTY, uh, no standard in works, whether it's by typing or, or, or uh, piping or anything like that. So uh, it's important to remember the behavior and the distinction between Docker Compose and Docker when it comes to standard in, standard out. If you want to understand more of those details, um, I wrote a script that gets all of the information you could possibly want about standard in and standard out uh, and standard error. Um, and it prints it to terminal. So using this script, you could tell if uh, you would run this in Docker with different flags, and then it'll tell you, is your standard in a TTY? Is it a pipe? Is it a file? Is it a terminal? Um, is it buffered? Uh, buffering is also important to understand. Um, and is it readable, uh, true or false? And all of these flags will be subtly different depending on what Docker flags you use. Uh, and in general, in Bash, these things are subtly different uh, depending on what you're doing. So like if you're piping in a file, um, is file is going to be true and is pipe is false. Um, but if you're piping in from another command, then is pipe is true and is file is false. Um, so I would recommend reading through this script um, because it might clear up some other parts of your understanding about how uh, standard in and standard out work in terminals and Linux in general. Um, it definitely did for me. Uh, writing the script was, was very eye-opening. I didn't even know that some of these things were different. Um, I wasn't even aware that sometimes things are buffered and sometimes they're not. So what's buffering? Buffering means if you run a command in Docker um, or in Bash in general, it either has a choice to collect a bunch of lines together and then write them all to output at once, or it can write them out immediately the moment it gets them. The default behavior in Linux terminals is to buffer by line. So every command that you pipe something into waits to receive a full line, um, and then it does whatever it's going to do. It doesn't operate character by character. So if you're sending in a stream of A, B, C, D, E, F, G into another command, um, it's not going to actually receive that A, B, C, D, E, F, G until it gets a new line. So that's what buffering is. On Linux, uh, the behavior is a little bit subtle. So it's, it's line buffered by default. But if you send a line that's larger than a certain size, I believe it's uh, 1,000 kilobytes or a megabyte, uh, then it switches to being character buffered. Uh, because it detects that you're trying to process like a stream of data that's really large. Uh, and it doesn't make sense to use line buffering with a stream of data that's all one line, right? Because you're going to have to wait until you get the entire stream before you can operate on it. Um, so Linux will automatically switch between line buffered and non-line buffered, uh, depending on how large the standard input is uh, and sort of the environment that it detects. And so you kind of just have to run the script in all of the different environments and see in what cases is it line buffered and what cases is it not. Um, and to control the line buffering is actually quite difficult. Uh, you might have to wrap it uh, in another command that unbuffers it. Uh, in Python, you have some flags. Uh, Docker file. Uh, yeah, in Python, you have this flag that you can put in Docker that says Python unbuffered equals one. Um, and this essentially forces it to, the moment you get any output, print it out immediately. Um, an archive box has a progress bar that it prints character by character. And so we need to use this so that um, when you print output from Python, it actually shows up on the screen before you hit the new line. OK, that's enough standard in, standard out. Um, so what happens to logs with Docker? Um, Docker has its own logging system. So all standard in and standard out from containers um, is collected by default into sort of binary blobs, uh, again, in a black box somewhere in the Docker file system. You don't really get to interact with log files directly ever. You only query Docker, show me the logs for a given container. So you could do. Docker logs, and then pass a container ID, and it'll print out all the standard errors uh, and standard out. Uh, you could also do Docker compose logs in Docker compose, and that'll print out, again, standard error st standard out from that container. Um, there are also like tail equivalents. So you could do Docker compose logs. I think dash F means follow, so it'll, it'll show all the output as it's running. Um, and that's all great, uh, but like, what if you want like normal log files? Like, what if you want like all your logs to just be in a file, and you want to be able to read that file? So Docker has, just like it has storage drivers, just like it has network drivers, it also has logging drivers. So you can define in your Docker Compose file um, logging driver uh, like JSON, something like that. 
docker json file logger. And what that tells Docker to do is it'll store all of your logs in JSON files and manage uh, rotating them when they get too big, um, as opposed to just storing it uh, like in a binary blob somewhere that you can have, have uh, access to. So the JSON file driver, um, yeah, you can you can pass that either as command line options um, and tell it to log to a file uh, with a maximum size and everything, or you can use Docker Compose uh, and set uh, you know exactly the same parameters. Uh, yeah, it's log driver colon JSON file. You know, log driver, something like this. I don't remember exactly. If you need this, you can look it up. Um, I like doing it just because I like things being in files. I don't like things being owned by the sort of magic black box Docker file system because you can accidentally delete them, forget about them, you know, reinstall Docker and lose it all. It's always better to have stuff on the file system when you can. Um, OK, before I talk about init systems, uh, just the last couple of things. Um, let's talk about the container lifecycle. So what happens when you start a container? So let's say we, we do Docker run, uh, something like this, right? This takes the image that's defined, and it drops into the entry point defined in that image. So the entry point uh, for Ubuntu is bin bash, and the command that we pass is also bin bash. So it runs bin bash twice. Uh, it's not a big deal. Um, but essentially, in this container, inside of this container, PID 1, the very first PID in the system, is bash. So inside the container, PID 1 uh, is whatever process you want to run in that container. This is very different from on the host system. right? On the host system, PID 1 is in it. Um, it's the thing that starts all the other things on your computer. So when you boot a Linux system, PID1 is in it, and then in it starts uh, system D, it starts uh, you know, your display driver, it starts your window system, it starts your terminals, it starts Chrome, it starts you know, all the things you want to start get started as children of init. Inside of Docker, you don't have an init system. You just have one process, and that's PID1. And whatever process that process, whatever subprocesses that process spawns, get you know, PID2, PID3, PID4, so on and so forth. So Remember, uh, back at the beginning, I said, you don't want to have multiple processes in a single container. Uh, Docker is designed to not need an init system. right? You want to generally have one process per container. But sometimes, uh, that doesn't always work. So Django is a great example, because Django has multiple worker processes that deal with uh, requests. And uh, it might want to fork those processes when it starts uh, inside of Docker. And so in that case, you need an init system like dumb init to clean up all those child processes uh, when you stop the container. Um, so that's an example of having an init system inside the container, is that dumb init. An example of having an init system at the container management layer is that uh, restart always uh, or restart on failure option that I showed you. So when you do this, Docker itself is sort of your init system. It manages starting and stopping your containers. And then another option, which is the one we use at Monatical in production, is to have another init system outside of Docker that manages starting and stopping entire Docker projects. So Supervisor D, the way we have it set up, uh, hold on, let me just exit out of this. Supervisor D is a very simple init system Oh, I don't have it in this project. Uh, so, huddle. so let's look at the one for Matchmaker. Supervisor D uh, has a list of programs that it needs to start at boot, a command to start each one, a directory that that command is run in, and then a bunch of other options uh, that define sort of the minutia. So auto start equals to true tells us that if this entire command fails to run, um, or if it fails, uh, Auto start makes sure it starts at boot, and auto restart makes sure it gets restarted uh, if it ever exits unexpectedly. Uh, it'll only try five times. Uh, it'll wait this many seconds when it stops it before killing it. And stop as group is really important, because when you run Docker Compose up, it forks a bunch of child processes, one for each container. And so when you stop Docker Compose, you want to make sure that you cleanly kill all of those child processes together. Otherwise, you get the same zombie process problem that I was talking about with them in it. Um, so stop as group equals true is sort of what dumb init is doing inside of the container. This is the equivalent for outside the container. Um, SD.log file uh, tells supervisor D 
take all of the output that Docker up produces, which is all the container logs, and put them in a file. And then also put the standard error in that same file. Don't use separate files. Uh, priority lets you define the order of different projects. So if you have three projects all in one server, uh, you could say start this project first, then this project, then this project. Uh, lower, lower priority goes first. Um, and then user root. You got to run the Docker commands as root. Um, Cool. So those are sort of your, your options for init systems. Um, you have inside the container with dumb init or supervisor. Um, you have at the container uh, runtime layer with uh, re the restart option. And then you have outside of Docker with supervisor D. So when you stop a container, um, what happens? Um, right, Because a container is not just the image. Uh, it's actually a whole file system with other stuff. Uh, you know, When you run a container, it has like var and opt and lib and like all these directories inside of it. So what happens to all that state uh, you know, when you stop the container? Um, it turns out it actually sticks around. So Docker, uh, Docker container ls will list all of the containers. Um, and notice, these containers are stopped. So what is a stopped container, right? Does that make any sense? I thought we have an image, and then we run it, and it's a container. And when it's not running, it's nothing. So why do we have containers that are sticking around when they're finished running? Uh, the answer is Docker doesn't automatically remove containers. Stopping a container is not the same thing as deleting a container. Uh, remember, a container is the instantiation of an image. An image is a description of how to build something, and a container is the instance of it. So when you run Docker commands, let's say, Docker run or Docker exec. Uh, exec runs a command inside of an existing container, and run creates a new container uh, to run that command. Unless you pass rm on the command line, when the container is finished executing, it's going to stick around. And then you can restart it, and it'll have all the same state inside as when you last ran it. In general, you want to delete your containers as fast as possible, as often as possible, because you don't want state to accumulate inside your containers unless it's in a volume. So let's take Postgres, for example. Right? All of Postgres's state is in varlib uh, Postgres, uh, and it's mounted inside of our Docker volume data Postgres. Now, we want to be able to trust that we can stop the Postgres container, completely delete the container, start it up again, and all of the state uh, will, will pick right back up where it left off just by using that volume. So it's good practice to delete containers often uh, and, and be strict about always deleting containers. Like, don't reuse containers uh, to to keep state between them. Right? The container should be ephemeral, and all of the state should be in the volumes. So we would we might want to like stop all these containers at once. Uh, one way to clear all of the containers on your system and all of the unused volumes and image cache and all of that is you can do Docker system prune dash dash all, and anything that's not currently running uh, will get deleted. So this essentially wipes your whole Docker system and restores it from scratch. But this should be safe to do, because all of your state should be in volumes. So as long as all of your state is in volumes, this is completely safe. right? When you rebuild everything and restart it all, it's going to pick right back up from that state. If your state is not in volumes, then this is destructive. right? This will delete all of your containers where your state is, and it'll delete all the named volumes uh, that aren't attached to anything. So that's why we have to make sure to keep all of our state bound in real folders uh, and then it's always safe to prune the entire Docker system. Um, I think that's that's uh, enough for today. Uh, are there any questions about um, what we covered so far? Cool. Um, yeah, thumbs down or, or hand raise uh, emoji if if you have any questions. Otherwise, um, in the next workshop, uh, we can look forward to Docker Compose, um, more details about like really what is Docker Compose, um, different advanced usages. Um, we already covered a lot of this stuff in, in our, our talk today. So um, I might spend more time on Argo and what, how we use Argo effectively at Monatical and what are some of the benefits of Argo uh, and Cloudflare in general. Uh, cool. Thanks. See you all. Thank you, Nick.